Okay, I'm in Virginia, Georgia's in Florida, and I'm here for my diocesan convention being held here in McLean, Virginia. Christ for the sake of others is my diocese. Georgia's from the Diocese of Central Florida and the Episcopal Church, and it's a good time to catch up. Uh, George, every once in a while we talk about the weather, but that's getting boring. How's the family doing? Exciting times. My daughter was so pleased, Claudia, who's the poetry major. She said, Daddy, I've won a fellowship to go to Poetry House in New York City to participate in a poetry writing workshop for a week. And they'll pay all my uh, all my fees and tuition and I'll have a poetry reading on Thursday night. And it'll only cost you airfare and accommodation and walking around money. So $1,000 later, my daughter is taking advantage of a wonderful week in Matt in Greenwich Village uh, sitting around with a bunch of people with these little beards right little here. Little beards, they wear white gloves, and they, uh, and they, they when they talk, they click, yes. Well, it's funny. Claudia is an English major, and she's always, even in high school, she would go, she would have poetry readings at the local coffee bars. Uh, really are stock full of them in Florida. Okay, I admit, the local Starbucks. On Saturday night, the cool people would gather there and read poetry, and uh, Claudia's always been into that. And she's actually good at it. So I'm so proud of it because I don't think she'll make a career of being a poetess, but uh, it's fun. Fun to do. It's a great hobby. Uh, I spent 15 minutes trying to find a light in the hotel room that would uh, work to light my face, and I finally found a way to make this dark on top. I should sell this type of technology. I, I don't a have a shine on top donations, Kevin. A light to light up the world. What no, is well, that's the face. I got the white little beard going, too. Okay, George, on to some news. Uh, what would you like to talk about this week? I, I, we didn't have a long time for pre-show, so this is casual. Let's just go for it. Lots of exciting things out there. Uh, there's a fun little story about a senator grilling a, a, an ACNA lay person. Uh, had he now or had he ever been a member of the Anglican Church in North America? Uh, <laughs> well, let, let's back up a little bit. You remember John F. Kennedy. Yes. Okay. Before he was assassinated, he was Roman Catholic. And, uh, and, and I think he still is Roman Catholic, but okay. go ahead. Yeah, right. And so uh, he was going to run for president, and everybody says, oh, we can't have a Roman Catholic as a president because he has to pledge allegiance to the Pope, and that means the Pope is the president of the U.S. And so we went through this whole rigmarole. Well, it just happens to be in our Constitution there you can't allow for a religious test in uh, electing presidents or uh, bringing people to, to the judicial or the executive branch. Mm -hmm. And well, the, uh, this all has come up in a series of uh, the U.S. Senate has been interrogating nominees for the judiciary put forward by Donald Trump. And most famously, uh, a, a woman professor from Notre Dame who's a practicing observant Roman Catholic was grilled. She's going to go to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals and Diane Feinstein basically said, you know, her Roman Catholicism is very, very difficult for her because she might make decisions based upon natural law and such things like that. Well, you know, hey, beat up on Catholics. That's the American way. But now uh, Sheldon Whitehorse, who's an Episcopalian, he's a Democrat senator from Rhode Island, uh, interrogated one of Trump's nominees for the circuit of the District of Columbia man named Trevor McFadden, I believe, who happens to be on the vestry of the Falls Church. And he had questions about, you are a member of a church that broke away from the Episcopal Church over homosexuality, and your clergy have made these statements that we're going to defy gay marriage, and have you now or have you ever been a member of the ACNA, and will you uphold the true internal laws of the United States and put God's laws to one side? It was rather all over the top, really. It was. But, it was like watching McCarthy all over again. But the uh, but it's now conservative evangelicals, even Anglicans, are being put to religious tests that they only used to give to Roman Catholics and Jews once upon a time. Now, really, isn't it ironic they don't do this in Europe anymore? If you're an <laughs> they, Anglican, they automatically disqualify you. <laughs> no, I mean if you if you're from the Church of England, you're automatically assumed to be one of us. You know, you're soon to be an atheist. That's right. He's just like, <laughs> oh, you're a bishop in the Anglican Church. You're safe. No big deal. Come on over. Join the judiciary. Well, well the good news was that this fellow passed 84 to 10. Uh, 
and he had a very strong that's a very good margin whereas the judge for the seventh circuit was a, was a closer margin because the uh, uh, drums were beating louder because that was an appellate court but it's quite extraordinary that the uh, one of the things that conservative uh, religious leaders held their nose and said vote for donald trump was that they wanted to see the judiciary of the united states changed we've had under don uh under barack obama uh, a sharp move to the left of activist judges judges who uh basically say that their job is to uh, to find the desired result not to uphold the law they're ideologues not jurists and donald trump promised to appoint originalists or uh, people who said the Constitution says what it says. It doesn't mean something different today than it did 10, 100, 200 years ago. And the Democrats, some of them in Congress, in Senate, are fighting an action to prevent originalists from being seated. And usually these attacks take the form of character, of their religious and social or cultural background. So this is part of a bigger fight going on to sh change the culture of the United States. And you, you say it's a bigger fight. When Barack Obama was elected, uh, the Republicans didn't fight him on his uh, nominees unless they were really, really bad. Um, basically, you know, the, the rubber stamp, this is, you know, you're the president now, boom, you're the president now. And most were, you know, fully moved into their jobs within, you know, four months. We're going on nine, ten... 11 months since uh, our new president has taken office and we still have people waiting in the wings to become part of the judiciary and the appellate courts yeah and the uh no, I, I don't want to make this program political i just want to show the uh the difference between you know uh sticking your heels in and fighting to the death for what uh and you know saying okay the america wants this we're going to rubber stamp and see what happens well, one of the things we haven't really talked about is Mike Pence, for instance, vice president of the United States, is a Roman Catholic on paper, but he attends an ACNA congregation in suburban Washington. You can't tell people these type of things. That, you know, you're going to ruin him. People like Mike Pence. Now the Episcopal is going to hate him. Uh, and, and Donald Trump was married in the Episcopal Church for the third time. It's the only place we'd do it for three. you lucky three. Uh, that, I mean, and I know this for a fact because I had a good friend who was the curate that goes to buy the sea in Palm Beach for the third wedding. They had to get a special license from Bishop Leo Frati to allow number three and to make it closed door, off limits to anybody but those invited. Well, like I, I a, heard a, when a, you get to three, they give you a coupon for uh, uh, multiples. So. Well, he got a discounted rate on the premarital counseling. But the uh, but I, actually, to be frank, if I were a member of ACNA, I'd sort of be excited that our little denomination is now on the crosshairs of the democratic party of the united states that's yeah i i, I agree that you know uh there's a lot of exciting things happening in the acna right now and uh um it's fun to watch one or many denominations here in america are really going through some struggles uh, some self-inflicted some and, secularly and, inflicted Kevin, and the guy and a uh, a number of the God clergy I know in the ACNA have for years been wanted to be martyred for something. They just have been waiting for an opportunity to die a bloody death uh, for their faith, and nobody's given it to them. And now, and now, they're on the crosshairs of the, uh, the, the Democratic Party. I would be excited if I were you. I mean, well, uh, if, when, when Trump is done, if Mike Pence walks in, we have an ACNA guy a heartbeat away from the presidency of the United States of America. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and do you remember during the campaign, John Kasich is a member of an ACNA congregation in Ohio. Uh, boy, these, these, these nasty little conservative Anglicans are just popping up all over the place. We need to act now and stamp them out. I did a, a nice show this week with Gavin Ashton, and be sure you watch it. And in there, we talked about the Reformation. And part of what we talked about was, he said, Kevin, um, you know, a couple guys got together and they posted a doc, uh, doctrinal statement on some walls or wall stores of the cathedral. And I said, That's, I knew that was going to happen. I didn't know if it was going to be in England or where it was going to happen. I knew somebody was going to pull the stunt. And I thought I'd talk to you a little bit 
more with you, George, about it because the stunt is growing. Well, Kevin, you've got a very good noun there, uh, stunt. And uh, I was loath to report on this because at first it was just a stunt. In other words, uh, it, it was sort of of par parish newsletter quality uh, news. But here, now I can give a bona fide news report for Anglican Inc. because the Bishop of Liverpool has given an over-the-top over condemnation. See, so far, uh, five cathedrals, Hereford, uh, uh, Rochester, Canterbury, London, and Southwark, uh, south, London south of the river, have in the middle of the night had the Southwark Declaration, which is about a year or so old. It was a statement signed by about 60 conservative evangelical clergy calling upon their bishops to be faithful to the gospel and to the reformed teachings of the Church of England. And to mark the 500th anniversary of the nailing of the 95 theses, they get out blue sticky tape and put the Southwark Declaration all the doors of the cathedral because you know southern cathedral has a glass door so they really couldn't nail it and the rochester cathedral is this medieval thing and they'd get arrested for defacing uh historic property if they put a nail in it so sticky tape blue sticky tape these theses well that's nice uh but paul bays the bishop of liverpool who is one of the bishops who's come out of the closet and is actively campaigning for the pro-gay side tweeted his disgust Citing Karl Marx, that history of first time is tragedy, second time it's farce. Now I've got a wonderful story. Liberal bishop condemns calls to reform the Church of England as farce. The you know the movement, rising movement of conservative evangelicals to reclaim the church has been denounced in no uncertain terms by a liberal bishop who says there's no need to change. Well, here's where we need to stop. Heavy breathing, heavy breathing. Yeah, heavy well, breathing. But, 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 here's where we need to stop. Because Martin Luther did not wake up one morning and say, I'm going to change the Roman Catholic Church. What happened was he said, I want to talk about these 95 different ideas. Uh, I don't even think he really put them on the door, but uh, uh, he put them on a bulletin board somewhere. And the reaction to the thesis is what uh, eventually caused the Reformation. Uh, like we always have is there's an overreaction. And I would love to see the Church of England overreact to this in order to cause a little bit of reformation within the uh, the Church of England, George. Well, they've started to. In other words, uh, Bishop Bayes was trying to be clever. And other bishops try to be clever on Twitter. And folks, unless you're Dan Martins and you're a bishop, stay away from social media. Yeah, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Yes. The rest of you guys don't. The sarcasm and being snarky may work for my teenage daughters, but it doesn't work for middle age men in their late middle ages. It just doesn't. It doesn't work. So this is actually because of the over the top reaction. We'll see if another guy takes a wit smack at it, and if that's so, then it'll take off and move out of the uh, church press into the regular press. But good for these guys in England who have uh, stepped out and put their careers on the line. Uh, if they weren't on the line already, they are now oh, yeah. standing and, up for what is right. You know, if we have another diet of worms and go through all that again for uh, a couple of clergy in the Church of England, I'm all for it because uh, the reaction always leads to reformation. Uh, and I think that, you know, the, the reaction with the Roman Catholic Church was the cry for help that they needed, reformation. Now, speaking of reformation, there's a third story. I haven't shared it with you in our pre, uh, pre-planning. pre Well, I, I'm, I'm going in here blind, George. Be well, gentle. I usually do, too. I just... <laughs> you can say, yeah. Be gentle. The Australian, which is one of the major Australian daily newspapers, had an article yesterday morning that's a scoop. Evidently, Pope Francis has authorized a committee to put together an ecumenical communion service. And they've already had some dry runs in northern Italy with Protestants. Now, this this starting to go through the conservative Roman Catholic press because Pope Francis deliberately cut Cardinal Sarah, who's an African, 
and a very conservative man out of the process. He's in charge of liturgy. He cut him out, put Arthur Roche, who was a liberal Englishman, in charge of this to find a communion service where we can all be one. Now, from an Episcopal point of view or a Protestant point of view, gee, that's great. But as the rump, but if this is as the Australian and the conservative Catholic uh, websites are saying, this might be the bomb that really sets off the Catholic Church under Francis of essentially abandoning the traditional understanding of what happens at Holy Communion, moving to the Protestant do this in memory of me rather than this is the body of, this is my body, this is my blood, and I, a priest of Macamini, in the persona of Christ. Francis is up permitting this experiment. I don't it's want to, exciting it, stuff. It is exciting, and I don't want to pat myself on the back here. But you remember when... But uh, you knew this already? Yeah, yeah well, no. I, when Pope Francis became Pope, I said, this is probably the one guy in the next you know, three or four generations who could do an open table, could start the process for an open table. And you said, Kevin, you might be right. Um, I always say, Kevin, you might be right. People <laughs> tease us. That's, of course, one of the refrains of this church is, Kevin, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's one just, the, that's Anglican scripture. You know, it, it's just, you know, uh, uh, pushing Kevin's ego. No, uh, Pope Francis, uh, because of his persona, because of his work with the Anglican uh, uh, Church in uh, South America and our, our good friend, Archbishop Personal Venables, friend of Greg Venables yep. of um, Argentina. Has the persona that could start the ball rolling towards an open communion, which would start the ball rolling towards a uh, another council of the church, which is greatly needed. Um, you know, we may laugh and, and uh, see the bigger picture of how, you know, this is going to cause a lot of consternation within the, the conservative side of the Roman Catholic Church. But what happens a decade from now or two decades from now uh, may be uh, breaking news from the yesterday. Well, I'm going to tease some of our more conservative Catholic friends. Right now, you've got three initiatives of various publicity that the Pope is undergoing. Married priests. He has uh, asked the Senate of the Amazon, which is the sort of back country of South America, to consider having married priests. Right now, the only married priests are ex-Episcopalians and Church of England people who have a special dispensation in the ordinariate, France, and of course, the Eastern Rite Catholics. Francis wants to have married clergy. He's talking about having women to the diaconate. He's created a study commission. He has uh, basically said, if you're divorced and remarried, you can come back to receive Holy Communion which is going to kill the Episcopal Church in the United States, because that's one of our main recruiting tools. That's what you guys got at this point. And now, he, if what we're told is true of coming up with a, ma with a Eucharistic Mass that downplays the role of the priest acting in the persona of Christ and elevates the sense that uh, we are uh, at Unum Sund, one, you know, we're one in Christ, and that we're doing this in memory of me, Man, that's straight out of the Book of Common Prayer. I mean, the Book of Common Prayer slices it three ways. It's memorial, it's transubstantiation, it's consubstantiation. Speak loudest the one you like. The and Catholics here's our chance there. to save the Pope a lot of work. Let's just send him, uh, what? let's do right to, send him our, our uh, Eucharistic uh, prayer right to, and it covers everything he's looking for. Well, basically, Kevin, all that the Catholic Church is lacking right now is a good pension fund for them to be an Episcopalian. Look, they got a lot of crazy nuns who would be wonderfully crazy woman bishops. They, I mean, all they need is the pension fund and hey, I'm out of a job here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know, it, they could do... Uh, bad contemporary music, bad praise music, ugly vestments. Come on, Kevin. I mean, they're going after my territory here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna file a trademark infringement. <laughs> the competition will be immense because uh, I think they own all their churches outright and they don't have any, you know, they are truly uh, hierarchical. Except, except when we have child abuse suits, then of course the the, the yes, they're not hierarchical. They're you know, held in laws. trust for the people so they can't just open and close them except when they want to open and close them. <laughs> okay, George, we, we've hit 20 minutes of droning on about the wonderful news 
uh, out there. I, I do want to follow that uh, the Pope story more. That's going to be something else. I'm glad you broke that for us. I'm Kevin Carlson. And Kevin oh. is the Pope Catholic. We shall see. Follow our next episode. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to break that news, too. I'm Kevin and Carlson. I'm George Conger. Yeah. And you've been watching episode 340 of Anglican Unscripted.